Hi, I'm Jennifer Boyat. I'm the host of A Conversation with Leading Peacemakers. This is our 10th edition that I'm very excited to share with you. It is time for our leaders to be peacemakers and for peacemakers to be our leaders. And again, just as a personal note, again, 10th edition, I started this in fall of 2021. And people have been very gracious to share their stories and um, just I've been really pleased with how this this project has grown and, and that I get to still share it with all of you listening. Um, I'd like to welcome with me tonight um, Dr. Gina Garcia. Dr. Garcia is a professor at the School of Education at, at UC Berkeley. Her research centers on issues of equity and justice in higher education with an emphasis on understanding how Hispanic serving institutions embrace and enact an organized, an organizational identity for serving minoritized populations. And she wrote a book about that as well, that I believe we'll get to hear about. And she hosts a podcast that explores around that topic. Welcome, Gina. Thank you. We have with us Gloria Rhodes. Gloria is an associate professor at the Eastern Mennonite University, located in Virginia, and she is the director for the center of the Center for Pe Justice and Peace Building there. She's in, been involved for years in many opportunities in teaching and training regarding conflict resolution, peace building, mediation, cross-cultural experiences. And I can't wait to hear about her experiences and the wisdom she brings from them. Hello, Gloria. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Becky Baker is a program director at a Cincinnati-based organization called Ignite Peace. They are dedicated to educating and advocating for peace challenging unjust systems, and promoting the creation of a nonviolent society. And Becky brings a lot of interdisciplinary background uh, to this work from her education and previous service. Welcome, Becky. Everybody, thanks for having me. So let's just dive right in. And we're going to hear from Gina, Dr. Garcia first, and Gina, tell us a little bit about how you came to do what you're doing and uh, yeah, how how you arrived at where you're at and then go ahead and tell us what you're passionate about these days. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. First of all, this is a uh, the invitation uh, to to be in a uh, conversation with peacemakers is actually, it was it was an honor to to think that um, I'm seen as a peacemaker. Um, I hadn't really ever thought about uh, myself as a peacemaker, but I think a lot of the work I do is um, aligned with that um, ideology. And so I'm honored to be here um, and have this conversation. I, um, if I think about the way I um, do my work, I actually um, am writing a blog today. I was working on a blog about uh, the HSI movement, which is Hispanic Serving Institutions um, movement. And I'm talking about it in, in it about uh, like mass movement, social organizing, social movements, um, and how we are building a movement within colleges and universities. And that social movements historically, long time have um, led, for, led to change. Um, we often see social movements happening when there are injustices. Um, we're watching that right now, um, national or globally, um, as we all watch the conflict in Palestine. Um, and so we know that movements um, occur because of injustices and we know that movements um, will lead for lead to change, right? We, we believe in that, those of us that participate in, in various movements. So movements are a lot of things. Um, so uh, since that's on my brain, I'll, I'll, I wanted to start there because I was thinking about it and writing about it today. Um, but what is a HSI and how do I do this work? Um, I call myself a scholar activist, so I'll talk about that because um, I'm an academic and 
I am a faculty member. I'm a I'm a full professor with tenure at UC Berkeley. So I do a lot of research. Um, I write a lot. And that's not always um, a form of activism, but there are many of us that are using um academia as a as a way to to uh motivate a movement to push for peace, for, to push for social justice. And so that's how I think about that that term scholar activism um as using scholarship and research to push for change and to uh, advocate for social justice and peace. So HSIs are Hispanic serving institutions. They're colleges and universities that enroll a large percentage of Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Latine people. Um, there's nearly 600 HSIs in the country, in the United States. Um, most people know what historically Black colleges and universities are, and so they are similar but very different. HBCUs um, serve historically Black people, African Americans, and the descendants of enslaved people in the United States. And they were founded at a time of segregation. So they have a very distinct history of serving a community that was not being served by colleges and universities um, and have become very like spaces of, of justice and liberation, um, a space where, where social movement and peace happens um, is at HBCUs. HSIs are not that in that sense. Um, and are at a very early stage of making sense of what it means to serve a predominantly uh, minoritized population, which is Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Latine, but also other students of color um, enroll in pretty, in pretty high numbers. We're seeing the data. Um, these are institutions that also enroll a high percentage of low-income students, undocumented students, first-generation students, housing insecure students, food insecure students, some enroll um, higher percentages of formerly incarcerated people, people who have been minoritized um, in educational systems and were not admitted into educational systems. So HSIs are a place that are um, providing access to people that didn't always have access to higher ed, but we haven't fully um, come to terms with what that means for a, an organization, for colleges and universities. So many colleges and universities don't embrace that term, despite the fact that it's a federal designation and many people have it, many campuses have it, a lot of people don't actually know what it is. Um, and so those of us who are part of the HSI movement are pushing us to, to have a, a greater understanding and a greater um, awareness of what it means to serve a group of students who, who have historically been underserved by educational systems. And so that's where all my work is. My research is all about making sense of HSI, what does it mean beyond 25% uh, enrollment, and what does it mean beyond federal dollars, because there are funds that go into HSI work. Um, and so really thinking what does educational liberation look like? I talk a lot about educational liberation. If education, educational spaces were spaces of justice and liberation, what would they look like? And so we're trying to conceptualize that. My my research works on that, trying to conceptualize that. And at the same time, understanding that colleges and universities uh, want a quick solution <laughs> or a checklist. I was with the campus earlier this week and it's like, they want a checklist, right? Like just tell us what to do to do better. And it's just not that kind of work. It's definitely, it's long-term, it's uh, change, it's organizational change, it's social movement, um, and change doesn't come quickly. And so that's part of, of, of being a part of the HSI movement um, and being a voice in the movement is that it doesn't come easy and we have to sort of embrace the process and also embrace the conflict, which I think is part of um, peacemaking, right? Is also knowing uh, that there is conflict. Um, so that's a little bit about me and currently what drives me. Awesome, thank you, Gina. Becky, would you share with us your story and your work? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, hi everybody, I'm Becky. Um, I work at an uh, education and advocacy organization in Cincinnati, Ohio called Ignite Peace. Um, and through that work, I do um, some anti-racism work. We have a docu-series called Race and Racism in Cincinnati, which shares the people's history of how race has um, affected our city's culture and neighborhoods and education system from its founding all the way up into present day. Um, and I also, I'm working in the death penalty in Ohio, as well as uh, we do uh, our framework, we do all our work through a framework of nonviolence. So it's like sharing and teaching about 
what my model says and um, inviting people into that space. Um, I, uh, I feel like I kind of came into more like my understanding of peace work or nonviolence work um, uh, through more of like racial justice work. Or should I just like, I think backwards about how I ended up where I am. Um, I think that's really kind of where it started. Uh, like I remember protesting Farrah Gardner um, and joining Surge around that time and doing those that type of work. Um, when I was younger, I uh, thought I wanted to be a journalist, but that did not work out the way I wanted it to. Um, when I was in college, that was like the journalism sphere was rapidly changing. Um, and I ended up joining AmeriCorps, where I worked with um, families in foster care through children's services, and then I worked at a food justice nonprofit. And those two things made me kind of realize that I could still be enmeshed in like people's stories and people's um, like the human experience and be doing like really cool things. Um, so I worked at children's services for a while and um, uh, did a lot with like families in foster care. Um, in rural Appalachia and um, came to realize that like kind of I was like working within a system that was perpetuating a problem and I was like oh well I'm gonna go to grad school and I'll figure out how to you know solve these things <laughs> and went to grad school um, and uh, for social work and became a school social worker after that um, and then came into this job. And I think what really drew me to this job was the racial equity work um, and have since grown to understand, you know, how, what nonviolence work is and what's it about, what it's about. Um, it's really the presence of justice that it's um, being active in your community and um, providing, I think radically imagining a different way of being than we currently are. Um, which is really exciting for me about peace and nonviolence work. And like the, uh, I've had someone say before, you're like, we have the, like, we're going to keep trying, right? we're going to keep working to create this new world. Um, we, we're going to mess up and that's okay. Um, but to know that like, we're all trying to do this together. Um, I feel like I've been asking, I think I've been asking, you always have these like stories of how you came into like doing this work, you know, um, I think I recognized early on what it meant to be a girl um, through just some experiences I had. And um, I think that is kind of what propelled me to be able to recognize other um, situations of injustice. Um, I think I also grew up with like my dad and my mom were always just, there was just like this inherent thing that you like help other people. I, like, um, I don't know if help is the right word, but that, but that like, it's good for you when other people are doing well too, right? Um, like, I don't know. I just always remember, I remember, you know, we pulling over to the side of the road to help people with, like, my dad, distinctly, like, with this woman who, with a kid, a bunch of kids, and had a flat tire. Like, I remember that. I remember um, this man who was trying to sell this ring at a gas station one time, and my dad just pulled cash out of the wall and says, I don't need the ring. Like, just, I hear that you need money. Like, take this money. Um, and I, 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 yeah, sorry, I feel like I'm rambling now, but, um, the help that is, is not, and I, when I hear the word help, I just really, I don't like it, but I just, when I think about, um, like the kind of community I want to live in, I'm always thinking like, well, what would I hope that someone would do for me? Um, and that's kind of try, how I try to navigate it. Um, I'm really excited about kind of the doors that like Ignite Peace has opened, um, to really understand how um, systems intersect um, and the work of Miriam Kaba has been pretty um, enlightening for me too, just to like radically be thinking about um, how we can transform the space we're in, um, especially bringing other people into the work too uh, is really exciting. So that's my little rambly intro. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Becky. Gloria. Tell us about your journey and, and what you're in the middle of right now. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've been inspired by listening to everybody else. And I'm thinking, wow, I've got to add things to my story. 
Um, I'm currently serving as academic director. I'm not serving as the director, but we currently do not have a director. So in a lot of ways, I am really serving as um, director of the Center for Justice and Peace Building. It is a center that includes practice, but it's also a program that uh, at our university offers three graduate degrees, um, one in conflict transformation, one in restorative justice uh, graduate degree, and one in um, transformational leadership. And so it, it's kind of our flavor of um, these programs, but they're very similar to other um, practice focused uh, conflict resolution, conflict, um, in, in, you know, conflict facing programs where they're working on how do we understand conflict? How do we figure out what to do about it? And the other part is around um, social change. So we're really interested in how to practically help social change to happen in ways that are less harmful. So in all the, there are so many different ways, and and many times we do have to um, to escalate, but we're trying not to intensify conflict, like not make it more violent, but working with how do we escalate and but not intensify. Um, how I got to where I am. Um, I've had the privilege of growing up in a Mennonite community uh, where we uh, where you know there were shared values for peace and nonviolence. Mennonites are a historic peace church along with um, brethren uh, and Quakers. And uh, by being a peace church, it means that we have um, values for nonviolence. And it means that um, we're pacifist and we wouldn't, join um we wouldn't join the military as young people that kind of that kind of thing and so by growing up in a community like that i have uh, always felt supported that my values are shared uh, across lots of folks and i felt supported in doing the work of peace building or peacemaking um in whatever form and so um how i how i got to where i am i i did um in undergrad Grad. I was also interested in journalism. This is where I was going down all these streams with folks, but I had an English um, language and um, writing uh, major, and I had a minor in journalism. And so I worked and my practicum was in um, at National Public Radio uh, with the Saturday Weekend Edition um, program during college. And that helped me understand that I was more of an activist than I than I knew, because um, in journalism, you have to tell both sides of the story. And I felt myself um, really resisting telling the other side of stories that I felt passionately about. And so I, um, I did work for uh, a local national public radio station for a while uh, after I graduated. But then I really, um, that helped in my formation of thinking about what do I want to do with the values base that I have, and one of the um, one of the really most important stories about why I'm where I'm at was that I was um, also really uh, interested in the story of people in Russia, and so this would have been in the um, nineteen. This was I, I will reveal my age if I say, that, but so in the late eighties and the early nineties, and so. Um, after there were lots of shifts with uh, the Cold War, the you know the wall fell in um, Berlin. Um, then I I really was curious about what's going on in Russia. So I I took some time. I spent um, supposed to be there for a year, and I I was there in the summer of 1990, and then I was supposed to be there for a year in 1992. Um, I ended up not being able to go quite the whole time because there was it was so much on un, un, instability, but. When I was in Russia, so I'm telling this little story. This is why after Russia, I came back and uh, changed where what I was doing with my life. Um, so in Russia, I was in a city of uh, one and a half million people, and I was in a university where I was teaching English and I was helping with uh, especially um, business English writing, but I was also doing a whole lot of other things, whatever people were asking for, because this city was a closed city. It had been called Gorky. It's now Nizhny Novgorod. And um, as a closed city, people had not heard 
uh, English spoken as a first language by by anyone really that hadn't heard native language, native English speakers. And so um, anytime that we would, uh, there were four of us at the university at that time, and we were all from Christian College Coalition, which is a, an organization that my university is part of. And so we, the four of us who were there, one was teaching American history, one was uh, working with um, cross-cultural programs, and I was working with cross-cultural programs, well, that's what they were called at that time, but I was also teaching English. And so, but um, one thing that the four of us did together was a Bible study, which was really interesting because it would be packed out totally, and people would be there from all, all stripes, all backgrounds, of you know of anything that you could find in a big city in Russia, um, and they were there to listen to us talk about uh, anything as long as we were talking. <laughs> and so um, there was one particular week when I was um, I was alone. I was 25 at this time, so I was alone in the front of the room. The, the students were about um, most of them were 17 or 18, and um, there were probably 50 crammed into a college classroom, and um, I was talking about the Mennonite peace position at that, that night, and I was um, talking about um, things like how do we how do we um, engage with others where, where where there's conflict, and so there are scriptural references to that in the Christian scriptures, and so I was talking about those kinds of things, and there were two very large Russian. Um, young men who um, started having a very heated discussion in the back of the room. And they were they were talking about what I was talking about, what they were talking in Russian. And my Russian, it was pretty good at the time, but it wasn't perfect. And so I was listening. Uh, you know, paying attention, I was trying to do my thing. But these guys in the back, these two guys, um, they, they really got louder and louder so that it became that I couldn't ignore them. And they were right in the middle of the classroom, in the back, it was standing room only, lots of people sitting in the aisles, that kind of thing. And these two guys, that was the kind of chairs where there's a little arm around you, it's hugging you and you and you write on your little desk. And so these two guys were sitting in these two desks and they kept, um, they were in rows, but they kept turning more and more to each other. And, and I was watching this happening and I'm, you know, I'm 25, I'm little Gloria Rhodes, the pastor is standing in the front of the room. And these two guys started getting so heated that they jumped up out of their seats. And the, you know how when you stand up out of one of those seats, they kind of stick to you for a minute and then they fall down. And then they were at each other and they were really fighting. And, uh, and one of them was a Russian Orthodox guy. And one of them was a, um, a varsity Christian fellowship guy. And they were fighting. And that, that moment where I, I was standing in front of this group and I and I was saying peace and, you know, the scriptures say peace to me and I'm a pacifist and these two guys are fighting in a Bible study. I, I, I was like, I, my, <laughs> and so, you know, all the other kids that were in there, some of them were my students in my English classes and they just like pull these guys apart and they, they sit them around, sit them down, get them quiet. And then I don't remember what happened next. I don't know, remember what I was saying and how we sort of resolved it. Now I would maybe know what to say more and how to have a conversation about that, you know, 30 years later. But that um, that incident made me realize that I was afraid of conflict. And I knew before, kind of, I always avoid, you know, if you're a pacifist, you kind of avoid it, right? But I, I decided that that couldn't continue. I had to I had to know how to deal with conflict if I was going to talk about peace. So when I um, left the, uh, Russia at, at that time, I'd been in Soviet Union before, but when I left Russia, I came back home, I canceled my literature um, applications to grad school, and I was like, well, that's going to be boring literature. I can study conflict resolution or conflict. And I applied to um, a doctoral program or master's degree program first at uh, George Mason University, which is in Fairfax, Virginia. And they had a program called Conflict Analysis and Resolution. I said, yay, that's for me. Um, and so um, that and that's actually the only grad program I applied to. I was just hoping I'd get in. I did, uh, which was, you know, quite you know, that for a humble Mennonites practice hum humility. So for a humble Mennonite to, to um, you know, expect that I could get into that grad program was quite, quite something. But anyway, after that, then um, I was um, recruited back uh, to EMU, Eastern Mennonite, because they were also starting a program in co uh, peace and conflict studies. It was the center, it was a different name then, but um, the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding grew out of that. So we've been uh, teaching and having a program for 
20, um, 29 years, I guess, this year. And I've been uh, at EMU in my career for 31 years. So I've been here a long time. We've been um, developing and, and changing and growing uh, in all that we do. Um, Yeah, I mean, is am I finished? I'm not. I don't feel quite finished, but I'm also fine with um, <laughs> maybe responding to questions. I should just say that the program has graduated about 800 graduate students, and we have about wow. 4,000 who've been through our summer peace building institute and uh, strategies for trauma awareness and resilience programs. So we're we're known internationally and kind of in certain pockets, but because we're doing this kind of education. So I'll, I'll end with that for now and say that I'm happy to answer questions. I'm, I'm working on a book. I'm working on a bunch of things so, and I'm doing some practice. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Gloria. Yeah, when you bring up uh, 1989, talk about peace. <laughs> they took a hammer to that wall. I just graduated high school or I don't know. I can't remember which month it was, but that was the year I was a senior. So that's the way you start your adulthood, watching them yes, take a absolutely. hammer to injustice, at least symbolically. I mean, obviously you can't do it all in one thing, but absolutely. it was quite I a have moment. a piece of that wall here on my, on my oh, desk. Oh, wow. It's very, yeah. in, it's very, it, you know, there it's, it was sold at a certain time piece by piece as a tourist attraction, but uh, it just, it does feel very meaningful to me to have a piece of this wall that was knocked down. Wow. Yeah. And it was like one of the first times when we were doing TV for things like that at least as it happened. Anyway, um, yeah, well, we can start with if if any of you already have thoughts or questions for each other or just something that came up for yourself from what you've heard, um, I'd like to go ahead and let, uh, allow you guys to, to um, do that before I jump in. But if anybody has any further thoughts that has come up, um and and anytime just kind of speak i guess but there were a couple of things notes that i had and maybe some questions um i uh you know when you were talking about movements gina um and we talk about change that takes a long time um i think a lot of it is the the actual change is sometimes very short, but we have to build to it. You know, we have to like put in the research. We have to put in the, uh, the talking about it, the, and, and, and then all of a sudden we get a new generation or whatever. I like talking, speaking of uh, being a girl or whatever, you know, the things that were so I had to work through for my entire life about being a woman, my daughters are like, okay. <laughs> you know, they got they get it in one because which is how it's supposed to go. You know, the next generation does does takes the baton and but there's layers on that. But and actually, did you get a chance to tell us about your book and your podcast, Gina? Go ahead and do that maybe for a minute. <laughs> yeah. I um I mean I've written a couple books about HSIs. I you know, like I said, HSI is like my core area of research. Um but the most recent book, Transforming HSIs for Equity and Justice, I provide a model. Like I said, mentioned in my intro, um, people want like a framework. They want like, how do you do it? Um, colleges and universities are interesting organizations because they're really big. Um, and and we, we, if we compare it to like a lot of spaces where um, organizing happens, it's often um, smaller grassroots um, nonprofits, right? that can move and we're much more nimble and much more easy to change colleges and universities are the opposite of that they're very set in their ways and are not interested in changing um yet some of the most substantial changes um over time that many of us have seen like stuff that came out of the civil rights movement for example gender and women's studies program ethnic studies programs um those were results of social of social movements um so i in the book transforming hsis i give uh, colleges and universities, a framework and say, if you want to change, here's some things to change. Um, here's nine dimensions of the campus that you can consider. Um, and I also give a nod in the book to grassroots organizers or grassroots leaders 
for the people who are within the organization trying to change it, um, often on the on the outskirts, often on the margins, often in small um, you know movement spaces, not necessarily the college president or chancellors or deans or VPs. Um, it's often people who are most connected to students, most committed, most committed to justice, most committed to organizing um, that are pushing for change. And so I give a nod to folks in the in the book about that as well, um, acknowledging that that's some of the best change work that we're seeing happening in colleges and universities is often from smaller movements, um, not necessarily from um, the higher ups. <laughs> the higher ups, um, don't always align with justice. I think, um, you know, I mentioned right now, we're all witnessing uh, globally um, a lot of movement um, to support Palestine and colleges and universities are shutting a lot of us down. Um, faculty are being told not to speak out. Faculty are being told not to organize. Faculty are being told not to um, participate in marches and rallies. Um, and colleges and universities historically in the U.S. are not about that. We're actually spaces where you're supposed to be able to organize and speak out for what you believe is right, right? And that what you believe is right can be in opposition um, to somebody else on the campus that you fully respect and that we should be able to have a space to talk about that <laughs> in, a, in an intellectual way. We're colleges and universities. We should be able to intellectualize that. We should be able to be peaceful with each other um, and we're just not seeing that and so it's um, a little bit saddening I think um, that that's the case that we're not seeing um, at least colleges and universities allowing for that space um, a safe space for us to have important critical conversations this is that's that's where we should be able to have it um, and I think that's why I talk about educational liberation it's like liberation would um, in an educational space would allow us to talk about all the complexities of any sort of conflict um, in an intellectual way without people feeling harmed um, or and or threatened, uh, which I think is what's happening. Um, so it's sad. I think we need a lot more peace right now. I think there's not enough peace um, making going on uh, within a time that is, the conflict just keeps getting more and more intense. Um, you know, Becky, you mentioned like the racial justice movement, right? Like that 2020, I think all of us would argue that summer of 2020 was such a, an important moment for many of us um, who do this work and we, it moved us towards racial justice, right? Um, many of us were already doing that work anyways, but it, it really sort of took a collective look at like, no, that's the framework, that, that has to be different. It has to be, um, you know, racial justice. And so, yeah, I think that's the book, a little bit about the book, that there is a lot of these things are intertwined in there. Um, and in the podcast, we talk about it in real time. Uh, research, as a researcher, um, research could take three to four years to ever get written. <laughs> so I'm published, so I might write it, but it might not ever get into anybody else's hands for another few years. That's sometimes too late. Um, and so the podcast is like, let's talk about it right now. What is happening right now in real time? So it's knowledge making and peacemaking in real time, right? That like we're having the conversation um, right now rather than waiting for it to come out four years from now in a book. Thank you. What are you hearing with your ear to the ground when you're talking with students, especially, um, yeah, the new generation and um, those who have different, the well, um, uh, Hispanic and uh, Latinx and and what the the younger people, I guess, although we get to go to back to school as older people too, so I guess it's everybody, but uh, what are you hearing, how they're talking about their experience, um, especially at college or just, um, and how that helps them in their society or not, or justice or not, and yeah. Most of the narrative right now is trying to create spaces of belonging, right? There's a lot of conversation around belonging and I dispute that because I don't think that there, most people feel like they belong on colleges and universities. Um, they're just not that space that we feel like we belong. Um, most people don't feel worthy in colleges and universities. Many of us that make it even up to high ranks, like a tenured professor, continue to feel like I don't really actually belong here. Somehow I got here. Um, I got, I slid through, nobody saw me. Um, actually, 
you know, making my way through. Yeah, we are worthy and we do belong, um, but we just are often made to feel like we don't belong. And that's many, many people in colleges and universities. So um, I think the narrative really is that, like, how do we actually change colleges and universities to be better spaces of justice, better spaces of belonging, uh, because they just aren't for most people. Um, historically, they're not the place where people go and just feel like they're going to thrive um, until you do find those spaces of belonging. Many of us do. Many of us end up thriving because we find the spaces. Um, but it's sometimes despite of the university, not because of the university. <laughs> it's like we did it because we're going to be <laughs> resilient regardless um, within within educational spaces. So, so yeah, I think people are just being more vocal about it, that like we don't, this isn't, this doesn't feel right. We don't feel like we belong here and we want to feel like we belong. Thank you. That's Can I really respond? Yes, um, go ahead. This is a, a really interesting um, conversation. It's like, what is the place of a, a college or university when there are students who live here and actually live here for four years? And so they actually, many of them undergrads, need to have a sense of belonging or need to have a certain level of belonging. And one of the things we talk about here a lot is communities of learning versus communities of belonging. What can happen in a community of learning that can't happen as well in a community of belonging? And then what can happen in a community of belonging that can't happen in a community of learning? That's uh, Those are concepts that are written about in a book called um, uh, Community, uh, I think it's called Dealing with Difference. Um, anyway, I can get the the um, book for you in a minute, but um, I, we like that idea because it's really the only way that you can invite people who have such massive differences in terms of their values and in terms of their commitments um, into a community like like a university and have them be also able to engage each other while still holding their own beliefs, their own values, their own so and so. We, we are teaching around, you know, what does it mean to be a community needs met, right? How do we find a community belonging? It's kind of like what you're saying, Gina, that we, we must have some belonging, but we also have to have the ability to have these difficult conversations across social divides, and we have to be able to challenge each other. I mean, that's what we're talking about, thinking about all the time. And so what I was going to say is that I'm at a very small university, and so that it actually makes a big difference at a small university. We can be very nimble. We can have conversations. We're bumping up against each other all the time. And so we have to have this conversations. But the problem is that a small university um, very quickly acts like a community of belonging, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then it's very clearly that they're outsiders, they're insiders. It, it's It's even felt more intensely if you don't belong. And then the problem of, do we all have to agree if we're going to make a statement? Do we all have to, um, you know, like, like well, so this whole, you know, the, our, recently um, there was a very long conversation about, very long, like a couple of days long, about, you know, do we make a statement about about Gaza, Palestine, Israel? And um, I think we're still chewing on what does it mean to do that? Thank you. Becky. You. Thank you for that. I'm going to look for that book. <laughs> we talk about belongingness, all a sense of belonging all the time in college and university. So, well, that's, I think that's a good point. But uh, yeah, there's always challenges to it. That's good. Um, Becky, I was going to say for Ignite Peace, is there like a flagship program that you guys do or some kind of specific ways that you try to engage your community or the people that come to your center? Um. I, so Ignite Pieces had a long history of, um, we were originally, so we were originally founded by four communities of Catholic, uh, Catholic sisters. And while we were like roots are faith-based, we're not necessarily faith-based now, but um, we were doing work separately. So they were doing all this work and they're like, we'd be way stronger if we came together. So we're really building, so the impetus of Ignite Pieces really to like, what can we do when we combine? Like we're all working on these separate issues. Um, and in the past, we've been, um, we were a big hub for the anti-Iraq war movement. Um, we've always been working to end the death penalty. We've had a presence at every single execution that Ohio has carried out. Um, and we also um, have a history with dialogues, um, trying to create dialogue around difference. Um, 
so today we we've definitely grown and changed over the years um and um i don't know that we have a flagship thing that we bring folks in um we do do a lot of work with faith communities um and organizing around that um but open to all folks uh but um we do do some like programming around nonviolence. Uh, we've been really working to kind of assess what that means and what people need and um it's interesting because we recently got called to ask to do a family mediation and we're just like oh we don't have like that expertise but when we look at our city we don't have that um so we're really trying to, to work to provide those resources um, i mentioned our docu series earlier um i think the power the difference of that um thing is that it tells a people's history so we're really invested in um telling history and stories um, it, we work in immigration as well, um, telling history and stories from a perspective that people are not used to hearing, um, that are not the dominant narrative or the dominant culture, um, or the, like, you know, what we hear from the conquerors and the oppressors, but rather from the perspective of the common people. Um, so I'd say those are the kind of the things we draw people in, um, and then we work specifically on campaigns. So we're not, <laughs> I've always feel like I have to give an like, explanation for what we do. Um, but yeah, that's, kind of where we're sitting. Um, we've long been like a hub for those sorts of movements and yeah, I'm kind of growing and changing as things grow and change. Yeah, so, being yeah. responsive to your community. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Gloria, do you want to show that on screen just real quick, your book, that book there that you had? You might have to say something yeah, yeah sorry i will read i'll read it it's a living with difference how to build community in a divided world it's by adam seligman um rahul wasserfall and david montgomery and this has been especially meaningful for us we're a faith-based university and so this um these three folks are from christian uh jewish and muslim backgrounds and so they're talking about and also um experimenting with how to do this work so they actually bring bring people together, so often um, adults, like so they may not be studying officially, but they're they're in a in divided context um, and they're bringing people together across big divides and ha helping um, having people, what, you know, what does it take to actually create a community of learning that's safe for people? Um, and by safety, I simply mean um, not gonna be harmed. And the, um, but also being able to have this difficult conversations right what does that look like so anyway that's my that's something that we use as a text um, for some of the courses thank you yeah. um another thread that i was kind of hearing um you know and this has come up actually in some of my other conversations and so i i think it just keeps needing to be known is that peacemaking is not being peaceful all the time <laughs> <laughs> that's not it it's it's because we have to and and what did you say escalate it but not or uh, you know and i i think yeah, what i escalate but not intensify or yeah like you're not going to end up bloody but we have to have this conversation now like this can't happen i mean this is not happening later this is happening now we've got to change this now you know and that takes a bit of um intense well i guess not for yeah. your word but yeah. it does take some uh the com discomfort i guess is one of the words we've been using in our in our uh, social conversation um but yeah i mean so that's that's always good to remember it's not that we're not gonna have to figure some things out or have emotions involved or um but, but it's in a way that we can have maybe some mature skills or just give each other the benefit of the doubt. I don't know if you guys have all, any all thoughts those about things. that. Yeah. yeah, all those things. I think that the difficulty has always been that, you know, everybody has a different idea about how things should be done. And so that itself is causing conflict. But what we're, what we're, you know, we're these little, this little peace church with, you know, who are Mennonites quiet in the land kind of people, right? But we're really about, like looking at the whole spectrum of how social change happens. And sometimes we have to have social movements. I mean, it's really often the only way things get done and justice be addressed. And so we're also can't have peace without justice people. 
I mean, we, we, I mean, very intently, right? That this is part of our our theology, even that, you know, without justice, peace is not possible. And so the the working for justice is going to take all the different all the different mechanisms that we can do. We have to we, at every level, policy. Um, on we have to be on the streets. We have to be individually talking to people. And we have to raise money, and so like all that stuff. But also, we have to be healing people who have been harmed, and we have to be working with people who are incarcerated, and we have to be working with people who are, um, at, you know, at, at all these different levels. So for me, I always say we have to have multiple actors, multiple roles, and multiple levels. So it's not going to work. Peace, peacemaking and peace building is not going to work unless we're doing all that. So thank, I'm very thankful for your work, Becky, and for your work, Dina, and and all and everybody else, because I need you doing what you're doing for my what I say to be true. <laughs> right? So it's for strategic peace building to happen, and we need all of us. So I need you because otherwise I'm not, you know, I'm not practicing what I preach. Gina, what's your megaphone mes- message if you want to share oh. with people what you would want to share to the world or people are listening? <laughs> That's a hard question. I, I, know. Know. I, I get on my soapbox a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of messages to be spread. Um, right. But yeah, I think it with regard to this um, conversation today, um, and I think some of the things, um, you know, that Gloria was just talking about is, um, that there is conflict in this, that it doesn't come easy. And that that's part of the process <laughs> that we need to embrace that, that we need to be okay with it. Um, that we're not talking about easy stuff, right? Calling for peace and justice is not something that comes easy, um, particularly when we are living in a society um, that is founded on injustices. That's really hard to undo when it's at our core. Um, So I think that's what I get on my megaphone about all the time is like, we have to undo what's at our core. We have to remember history. We can't forget history um, because history continues to repeat itself. We watch it over and over again, and the same results happen, um, which is that injustices, um, you know, hurt, harm those that are, are, have the least power and who are the most oppressed. Um, So yeah, we need to, we need to undo at our core historically who we are in order to really advance um, a peace and justice movement. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here with us. Um, well, and honestly, I think there was one more thing that kind of came out for me. It's when you were talking about helping Becky. Um, it's kind of, that's a hard question or not a hard question, hard conversation these days too, because we've all had to learn, um, and maybe more the colonist side of things than anybody, but um, that people can come up with their own structures, their own solutions, their own way of living. They don't need that dictated them by people helping. You know what I mean? So there's that. At the same time, when I think about if we had a world where nobody helped, that's also not where we want to go, <laughs> you know, because, because, uh then then it's like where's the help you know so I think I actually don't even know I mean I think about it quite a bit you know so do I help by not helping what what do I do <laughs> you know? and I I've been helped you know I've been helped so it's like I don't know I don't know anybody have any thoughts about that yeah I, I guess um for me like I think you know learning like being in community I think it's been really also really helpful for me to know when I need help and ask for when I need help um but I guess also like when I think of what I was trying to say too it was just like I think being um being like installed in community is what I think I was sort of what my parents were trying to show me um these are like silly things, but I've just had to think about this question a lot lately. So like, I just remember my mom always, she would always make it a point that 
if I had a birthday party, every single kid was invited. Like that sort of thing, if that makes sense. Um, and because she didn't want a kid to feel left out. Because there were times when she felt left out. And she, you know, like that sort of thing. And I think about my, like my um, aunts and my dad telling stories about like the small rural town they grew up in. And church for them was a very active thing. Like they talked about like sewing quilts and for people because people would need the quilts. Um, and so like when your your mindset is community rather than like individualism, I think that's where I guess the help, I guess, comes in. Right. Like it's it's about the like, what am I doing for the community um, rather than like how what is benefiting me the most, I guess. So I guess that's kind of like where I'm trying to go with that. But um when we start to think of it that way, rather than thinking of just who am I and what do I need and rather what is the benefit to the community is kind of where I, yeah, see that going, I guess, a bit. Um, yeah, and in my work with them, definitely, like, to connect to that, like, often those people are the most, like, forgotten, you know, just people who are incarcerated, like, discarded and pushed off. Um, yeah, and when I think about how do we prevent, you know, the death penalty from happening in the first place, it's like, what are we doing to prevent the violence that has been caused um, to those people who then go and harm people, right? Like violence begets more violence. But yeah, um, yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, can I just add that how I tend to think about it is that um, human beings have to have other people to meet their needs. We can't meet our needs alone. And the problem comes for me is that we all have strategies for how we want our needs to be met. And that's what gets in conflict with each other. This is from Nonviolent Communication, uh, Marshall Rosenberg and Compassionate Listening book, um, that, that we have these great strategies for meeting our needs. That's the way we want it done. And oftentimes that's not what the other person is capable of doing or wants to do or whatever. And so as we are thinking about, okay, what are the needs? We always put out there like how my needs are solved, my strategies for my needs. And that's not right for, it's not right for anyone else. And so people with power can do that and say, well, how I get my needs met is this way. So you, you should too. Or, and I want you to, I want you to benefit this way. Um, so it's really about listening. It's about, um, and, and really I keep saying humility and it's not just a Mennonite thing, but it's, it's the humility to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I can be wrong. I'm not the one who knows. So, you know, I can help you. I have funding or I have whatever. Um, so I can support, but I don't know. I don't know about what you need. So, you know, how, how can I best help that, that kind of strategy. Now, again, even I don't know how to do all of that right in every community because context matters. So, you know, somebody else's context I shouldn't be even offering unless I know what what the context is and but to offer to help help me other people's needs in the way that they need them to be met not not in my way that makes sense when I think about that that's cool mm -hmm. well we've already had a very nice conversation and really loved hearing from each of you. I'm going to let uh, Becky, what's your megaphone message? Your your message to the world. Um, I think that my megaphone message would be uh, to keep like, you know, radically thinking about what like an anti-racist world, a peaceful world will look like and when you really think about it, like what is present there? Um, and then think about how we get there because like when I think about it, it's, you know, people have healthcare, um, people are not hungry, right? Like we have um, things that we need. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's mine to radically keep thinking of a different way of being um, and to like hold on to that hope because, um, you know, I think I I often get pessimistic and cynical and you know does anything matter, um, but that hope is like an actual thing that we can like keep living into um, and that we can you know keep imagining a new world together and yeah that's a little 
me, but <laughs> that's, I think, what my Naga Thumb has said for me. Thank you. Yeah, I always say, you know, if I ask myself or if other people ask me, is peace possible? It's like, well, it for sure isn't if you don't think it is. <laughs> like, you have to at least start with thinking it's probably might be possible, and then maybe we're 50-50 there. <laughs> no, I don't know. But, um, yeah, and, and I think a lot of times it's creating these spaces where, and we all have have a space, you know, the universities or and probably more than one, obviously, you've got your family or what, you know, different spaces that we have. And if we can make the spaces places of safety and peace and justice, then people can come into them, even if they're coming out of a world that hasn't got it yet. They can come into a space and and that'll do. I mean, we've got more to go, but that that will start it for them at least. And um and I and that's why I love talking to you know people like you and why I'm doing this is because I want people to see that people are doing this. It is being done. It is here. We're not we're not done. But um there is so there is a lot out there and it just need, the word needs to keep getting out. Um Gloria, what is the your parting wisdom for listeners i like the the words megaphone better than parting wisdom because it, it, it puts a lot of <laughs> that's that's a lot on me i mean that's so so stressful the wisdom part um but i i'll agree that you know this whole thing about what is peace i mean we're all if we're all working to something different because we believe peace is something else then we're working at odds so, so that's um a, that's just a, a little piece of my message the other piece is i teach a class called formation for peace building practice and it means that it's how do we tend to what we need to in ourselves and so um that it so my megaphone message is that we're not going to be able to build peace unless we're taking care of ourselves and kind of a little bit like Ryan jennifer but that we have to really attend to how we engage in the world we have to learn 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 about how we help and how we don't help and we have to learn about you know all our identities and what it means to be you know a white person in the united states or or a, a dark-skinned person in anywhere you know anywhere in the world for example and um so my my megaphone is really self-care is not enough but we've got to do self-care but also, we have to do a lot of it. We have to do a lot of self-education, uh, educating about what what is peace to me? How do I get my needs met? What is my identity? When is it appropriate to engage? When is it not? What context am I in? You know, a whole, you know, all lots and lots of questions that I ask my students all the time because they're here trying to learn how to do build peace, how to build peace in the world. So that's my megaphone. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think we will close. And I appreciate you giving your time and and the work that you're doing. And I, one of the things I wanted y'all to again to see that people are doing it. Got somebody in Virginia and Cincinnati and California. And uh, <laughs> so, all right. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Gloria. And Gina had to hop out, but uh, thank you what, for what you're doing, Jennifer. I think getting the word out that that people are doing stuff is really important so thanks for that yeah thank you thank you it's yeah it's really cool to hear what other people are doing too I it's exciting and yeah it makes me feel better yeah more hopeful <laughs> no I think we need it all right we will say adieu <laughs>